How many of us have seen someone tempted shortly after they became a Christian, shortly after being baptized, and ultimately were lost forever because they lacked the ability yet to resist? I remember studying with a young woman about four decades ago and how delighted everyone was when she obeyed the gospel. Before she could attend the very first worship with her brethren, she was called to Wisconsin to minister to a sick relative. Well, uh, being conscientious, she decided to uh, go to worship on Sunday when she was there, and she could not find a congregation of the Lord's people so she did what uh, she thought was the next best. She found an assembly of God and began to worship with them. By the time she returned, she had become so indoctrinated that she wouldn't even discuss spiritual concerns with us. More recently, about a year ago, I baptized a man in his 60s who had studied with a member of the congregation he seemed as delighted to learn the truth as the Ethiopian eunuch. He was grateful to have finally learned what the Bible teaches about salvation all those years, and he did not know. So he was grateful to learn the truth. And uh, he obeyed the gospel and began to bring many of his relatives with him. Now, in the course of studying prior to his uh, conversion, he frankly admitted that his divorce was not a scriptural one, but that he didn't plan to ever marry again. He had been committing fornication with a woman, but when the study came to that subject, he gave it up. He realized that that was an error, and... Uh, he realized what the Bible taught about holiness and morality, so he gave up that relationship. But a few months after he had obeyed the gospel, he became ill. And this woman that he had had the relationship with nursed him back to health. And unfortunately, that uh, relationship was resumed. He paid for her divorce because she was married at the time. And then they made plans to marry reminding him that he was ineligible for marriage did no good. They went ahead and the church had to withdraw fellowship from him. It's sad that some people never seem to get very far in their spiritual life and the reason is because Satan has attacked them in one way or another and many times they're just simply not strong enough to resist. New babes are often very vulnerable soon after birth. Perhaps not coincidentally, Satan tempted Jesus shortly after he was baptized. Many others have not been as strong as the Lord after they have obeyed the gospel. They must be warned concerning the devil's hostility toward them. Now we'd like to, like to talk about some types of confrontation and uh, the first one is the type of confrontation that Jesus had with Satan. It's described in the three temptations. And that was not the only time that they faced one another. But the deceiver of the whole world gave Jesus many opportunities to sin. Of course, our Lord successfully conquered the devil in each one of them. Now, although Christ confronted Satan personally, directly, we do not need to fear confrontations of that type. It was personal. It was one-on-one, -on -one, Christ versus Satan, and Christ won. But he does not approach us that way nor through uh, his uh, demons as was done in the first century. God does not allow Satan to tempt us or confront us in that fashion any longer. Now there's more material on that subject in the book, but we want to move on to the next subject, 
which is confronting those taking the part of Satan. This is indirect. This we find a lot. And uh, we find it in the New Testament as well. Since we do not uh, need to worry about the devil directly, then uh, we're free? Well, not quite. Uh, we do have to be concerned. The New Testament explains why. Jesus confronted Satan when someone took Satan's view, when someone took Satan's position. The most obvious example of this situation involves a conversation between Jesus and Peter. Peter had just announced to the disciples what was going to occur when they went into Jerusalem, that he would suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day, Matthew 16 and verse 21. Now, such a thought was so abhorrent to Peter that he took Jesus aside and actually rebuked him saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. Verse 22. Now, we might have expected Jesus to say, Peter, I really appreciate your concern for me. And I know that you spoke these words because of your great affection for me. But there are a few things you misunderstand. If salvation is to be accomplished for all men, including you, I must suffer and die on the cross for everyone's sins. Evil men must put me to death for the spiritual advantage of all. Now, Jesus might have explained it that way. But as you know, he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. A lot shorter explanation. But to make a point, the other way would have uh, been okay but it wouldn't have made the point as dramatically as what the Lord does on this occasion. Jesus also said, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Verse 23. Peter did not realize it, but he was actually taking the part of Satan. He was saying what Satan wanted said in this matter. Now, it wasn't Peter's intent to do something wrong. The words, however, were discouraging Jesus from wanting to fulfill his mission. The crucifixion could not be attractive, could not be appealing to anyone. To have someone say that it would be an injustice for Jesus to suffer it or offer comfort and encouragement to avoid it was simply not helpful. All of us have unpleasant things that we would prefer not to do, that we would like to, be, uh, to opt out of, but they must be done. Studying with someone who must uh, be shown through the scriptures that he is in an adulterous marriage is an unenviable task. I think I'd rather have somebody pull a toenail out with pliers. Because it's painful to have to show the scriptures to people and, and watch their reactions and realize where they are. They thought they were married and in good standing and everything's going well. And now they find out that is not the case. But as unpleasant as, as it is, it can't be avoided. It cannot be avoided. We obey be, not because all commands are pleasant, but because they are God's commands. And it's his will. Was Abraham looking forward to sacrificing his son Isaac? Was he uh, whistling and just having a good time on the way there to sacrifice Isaac? Doubtful. But he trusted God that God knew what he was doing. Did Moses want to go to Egypt? It seems like he offered about five excuses why he was not the right guy. Did Jephthah really want to keep his vow? Jeremiah, on at least one occasion, did not want to preach the gospel anymore or tell the people God's word anymore. 
Esther was not particularly enthusiastic about approaching her husband king, knowing that she could be killed, but it was necessary. It was important that it be done. Although Jesus prophesied of what would happen in Jerusalem, was it an ordeal he really wanted to face? If so, why did he ask that the cup pass from him three times? He was willing, however, to subordinate his will to the will of the Father, and so must we have the same attitude. Members of the church do not need to have the stumbling blocks of Satan thrown at them by their brethren. We don't need to have somebody who's a member of the body of Christ try to talk us out of being evangelistic because that's uh, kind of scary for many people anyway. We don't need members of the body of Christ trying to talk us out of being faithful or morally pure. If one of Jesus' apostles could tempt him from fulfilling his task, then how many ways can brethren serve to discourage one another? Suppose one Christian couple is visiting another Christian couple on a uh, family on a, on a Sunday afternoon and about time to get ready for worship in uh, that evening. One of them says, you know, we've all heard tonight's sermon in one form or another, who knows how many times. Why don't we stay here instead and we'll continue to brainstorm about methods of achieving church growth? Well, that would be strange, wouldn't it? But it's probably been done. How many times have some members evinced a bit of spiritual spark only to be doused by another member's cup of cold water? That's not the kind of water you're supposed to give someone, by the way. Oh, you don't want to teach a Bible class. You know, if you start teaching a class, you'll be doing it forever. Door knocking? No, I haven't done that since I had three straight doors slammed on me ten years ago. No, I don't visit sick people. You can catch germs. Besides, I don't like hospitals. How many members have been talked out of doing things that they thought they would do, or at least thought they should do, by brethren? How many have been talked out of doing a devotional or preaching a sermon? leading in a prayer, or engaging in various acts of benevolence? How many have been discouraged by brethren? Are we an encouragement to members of the body of Christ, or are we a stumbling block? Now, what about confronting the devil's doctrines? Consider how many, how many of Satan's errors there are, but let's just... Consider a few, by the way, from uh, that so-called uh, placid piece of oratory, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus confronted Satan's errors in just that one sermon. And let's call attention to a few of these. Satan teaches that the way to impress others in this world is to be boastful and arrogant. Jesus said we should be poor in spirit. The devil says that we ought to do whatever is pleasurable and not withhold anything from ourselves. Jesus says that those who are blessed mourn. The devil says might makes right. And uh, that's the way of Darwin and of evolution and oftentimes the way of the world. Jesus preached meekness. Satan says the world has a lot to offer. Why not just indulge in a few vices? Jesus emphasized the blessedness that lies in hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Satan's saying is, no mercy. And yet Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. While Jesus came to bring peace between God and men, 
and also between human beings as well, the philosophy of the devil is to create conflict, to create discord, to have things result in fights, battles, wars. Satan's sermon is that you should never have to suffer, especially for doing right. But Jesus said, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Satan says that lustful gazing at the opposite sex is both normal and fun. But Jesus taught that whoever looks at a woman to uh, lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The devil convinced people in the first century to divorce and remarry for any reason that they desired. But Jesus confronted that position by saying that the one who divorces and marries again, unless his mate was guilty of fornication, commits adultery. And uh, part of that is found in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, and part of it in Matthew 19, 3 through 9. Satan says that people ought to treat others the way they have been treated. You treat me bad, I treat you bad. Jesus said we should treat others the way we want to be treated. And so in all of these passages and more, Jesus shows that Satan and his thinking ought to be confronted, that he ought to be challenged and not get away with that type of thinking. The devil also has convinced most people today that everybody's going to be saved. It doesn't matter what they've done. God will save them. Jesus said the reality is that the majority of people are going to be lost because they're on the broad way that leads to destruction, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Many will be surprised they're not among the saved. Matthew 7, 21 through 27. Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The devil teaches people that having power and ruling other, over others is a mark of greatness and superiority. Jesus taught that the greatest person is a servant. Not exactly the way the world thinks. And those, again, are just a few of the errors Jesus confronted concerning Satan. But we not only know that Jesus confronted error, and not only then, but all throughout his ministry, Jesus' disciples confronted error also. As time went by after the establishment of the church, many new doctrines were originated by the devil, and he has never let, uh, let, let up on that. Uh, there are, I think, new doctrines every day uh, that are introduced into the world. New concepts, new ideas that are not biblical, but which capture the imagination of men, and they start following after these things. The most prominent of, of these was introduced in the first century by the Judaizing teachers as they insisted that Christians still practice circumcision and keep the law of Moses, Acts 15, 1 and 5. A large portion of the New Testament is devoted to confronting this doctrine, which ultimately arose from the devil. Some in Corinth were challenging Paul's apostleship. As you study 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13, can you imagine that the Apostle Paul had to give a defense of his apostleship to Corinth, a place where he established the church in the first place? And he showed the signs of an apostle among them when he was there, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. It would be hard to imagine a greater endorsement of somebody as an apostle unless the clouds of heaven were to suddenly open and the Lord were to appear and say, I personally selected Paul as my an apostle. Now listen to him. The evidence is tremendous. Why would anybody doubt that Paul was an apostle? Someone had written to the Thessalonians trying to pass off an uh, epistle as having been written 
by Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. How presumptuous is that? The apostle John wrote of a brother who would not fellowship him because of his desire to have the preeminence. How could anyone act that way towards a genuine apostle of Jesus? If such things occurred while Jesus and the apostles were upon the earth, what can we expect now that their personal presence is no longer here? The fact is we, we should not be surprised. How long was it before Satan lied about God in the Garden of Eden? How long did that take? Sure, we see peace and love and unity and growth in Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost, after the gospel was first preached, but how long did that last? Practically every truth taught in the Holy Scriptures has been challenged over the centuries which necessitates a book such as this one in this lectureship and its predecessors on Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism and um, Calvinism and Roman Catholicism and so on. As long as the world stands, it will be necessary to confront the devil by opposing the false teachings that he has introduced. Thus, Jude exhorted, as you know, the brethren to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. We may or may not like the way things are, but they will not change while the liar, Jesus is love and truth. I believe I heard that somewhere tonight. Satan is hate and lies. And as long as he roams the earth, he will be disseminating those types of things. We may not like that. We may not even like to have to stand up and defend some of these things, but it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Well, let's talk about today's disciples a little bit and highlight a few of Satan's lies. The first one of these is atheism. Now, you might say, oh, atheism, well, yeah, we know all about that. The United States, however, if you are watching, is going the way of Europe with respect to Christianity. It's taken longer, and we may not fall as far, but Christianity is on the decline. Consider the religious liberalism in the Northeast and on the left coast, in the past 50 years, we have lost a tremendous amount of ground with respect to Christian principles. Church attendance has declined significantly, and many religious denominations have departed from the scriptures by refusing to uphold biblical morality. How many religious denominations today will speak out against abortion? or divorce, or gambling, or alcohol, fornication even, or homosexuality. How many will actually stand up against it? There was a time when even though they're unauthorized to exist in the first place, but nevertheless there was a time when they would oppose these things. For the most part, not anymore. Evolution has been taught which is, uh, goes hand in hand with atheism, in our public schools for decades. And anyone who holds a biblical worldview is considered unscientific and uneducated, despite a growing uh, amount of uh, emphasis on apologetics by a few. Brother Warren saw the need to have men with advanced degrees challenge atheistic beliefs on college campuses, especially in debates such as those that he had with um, Wallace uh, Matson and Anthony Flew. Faith in God, Jesus, and the Word inspired by the Holy Spirit are crucial to every aspect of our society. And yet, 
those are being eroded. We are losing ground on those matters. As Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Sometimes uh, parents are dismayed because children come home with some of these different ideas. And what they haven't realized is that these foundations have been under attack. They're just seeing symptoms here and there in another place. But it's the entire foundation that's been attacked by atheism and evolution. Just to cite one application, if people knew and respected the Bible, there would not be any discussion over homosexual marriage, let alone a vote. We ought to know if we know the scriptures that the practice itself is wrong, let alone even considering something so foolish as marriage between two people who don't have authority to be what they are in the first place. Perhaps more than anything else, we need to restore our Christian roots and heritage in this nation that we have lost. The Lord's disciples must also confront the errors of Satan with respect to salvation. Almost all Protestant churches these days are teaching and have been for a long time teaching salvation by faith only. All members of the body of Christ need to be prepared to meet this satanic teaching publicly and privately. It needs to be confronted in the workplace and on, uh, in schools, college campuses. One of the best questions to ask somebody in regard to that if the discussion comes up is, would you like to see what your Bible says about faith only? And if they're not willing to sit down and uh, go through uh, a Bible study with you, then maybe you can uh, get a quick look at James 2.24, and it might stimulate their interest. But this denominational error is absolutely fatal, absolutely fatal to anyone's spiritual well-being. How many thousands of people believe that they are uh, saved because they once admitted that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Even though they have never attended worship and they don't live by Christian principles. And they practice immorality. But because they made that confession one time, they think, I'm saved. They've been taught that they're saved, regardless of all these other things. And they believe it because it's convenient. And a second doctrine is like unto it, once saved, always saved. No doctrine of Satan is more fully refuted than this one in page after page of the New Testament. Yet Satan remains successful in selling it to people. The devil is not called the destroyer in two different languages in the book of Revelation for nothing. False teachings such as these cause men to place confidence in that which has no strength whatsoever to save. For choosing to believe these errors, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord because they knew not God and did not obey the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. So much more could be say, said with respect to errors of worship. Seventh-day Adventists remain a large cult, and they insist that the day of worship is Saturday. But others are willing to compromise the first day of the week, too. Roman Catholics have uh, done worship on Saturdays for many years, as well as Sundays. And a few years ago, I don't know if they're still doing it, but a few years ago, the Richland Hills Church, uh, once associated with the Lord's Church, but no more, began scheduling a worship session on Saturday evening. One, by the way, in which they could use instrumental music. And that's the second thing, a nearly universal error among those professing to be Christians regards the unauthorized use of instrumental music in worship. Brethren ought to challenge this concept with an appeal to Colossians 3, 20, uh, 17. 
Where is the authority for it? And take with that Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where God destroyed two of Aaron's sons who would have been priests after him because they offered up strange fire, fire they had no authority to offer. Why are we not saying more about that? It's one of Satan's doctrines that's been very successful that we need to combat it. The Lord's Supper has also been changed in uh, so many ways by various religious groups that it is scarcely recognizable as it was taught and practiced in the New Testament. It's amazing how many ways the Lord's Supper, such a simple thing to do and observe, has been perverted and twisted. How many errors are there regarding the Holy Spirit, which people have today? I find increasingly people have been bewitched by the satanic idea that what Jesus promised the apostles in John 14, 25 and 26, and John 16, 12 and 13, regarding he will send the comforter who will guide them into all truth, people are applying that to us. More and more I find people not even questioning that, oh, well, Jesus gave that to all believers and all followers. No, he gave it to them. He recalled to them all things that he taught in their presence. He guided them into all truth. He showed them things to come. He's not doing that to us, and yet that's one of the huge errors in denominationalists today. That that is still going on. But there are many other errors of the Holy Spirit besides that. So whether it be doctrine regarding salvation, worship, the Holy Spirit, or other biblical topics, the fact is that Jesus is confronting Satan through us as we challenge the devil's doctrines. Jesus ultimately confronted Satan on the cross. And he did it by submitting to the plans of evil and wicked men who thought the darkness could extinguish the light. Paul taught that the Christian wrestles against rulers of the darkness of this age, Ephesians 6:12. But there was no greater darkness, there was no blacker moment in the history of this world than when evil and jealous men crucify the innocent and sinless Son of God. What did they hope to gain? That he would be silenced? They all got their heart's diabolical desire. They won their victory. Jesus was dead. But the goal that they sought was very short-lived. It began to unravel quickly. When Jesus arose from the dead, the battle was over. They couldn't see it. They weren't aware of it. They didn't understand it, either many of them, either before or ap after it happened. Emotion-driven actions commonly do not think past the moment of achieving the goal. They do not often think past the moment of success. After the events of the crucifixion had ended and Jesus had been buried, it occurred to some of their leaders that he had claimed after three days I will rise. Matthew 27, 63. Therefore, they asked for soldiers to guard the tomb to make sure that the uh, Lord's disciples did not come and steal his body. Two things are noteworthy in this request. The first is they assumed that Jesus did not have the power to arise from the dead, that the only way he would leave the tomb was if his disciples came and stole him. So they asked for soldiers to uh, avoid that so that the myth, as they would term it, would not continue. Second, they were aware of what Jesus said. Did they really think he had no power? Certainly Satan knew better. Why did he want Jesus crucified? What did he hope to gain? 
Did he really think he could succeed and defeat Almighty God? Well, there's probably a certain amount of arrogance in Satan that he, he did think that. Perhaps he thought that. He had already led one unsuccessful rebellion, however, against God. Perhaps he thought Jesus would be so discouraged and so despondent on the cross that he would give in and sin. Could one possessing all power possibly endure the taunts, the mockeries, the insults of abusive men and fail to retaliate? Is that possible? And if he could, what about the Father in heaven? Could he bear to watch the suffering of Jesus and not do something about it? The Savior died sinless. Satan failed. Jesus confronted him and defeated him on the cross. Jesus and the devil had engaged in their ultimate earthly confrontation. The anointed one defeated the God of this world. Of course, Satan never grows discouraged. He still walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He continues to afflict the church. He continues to test and tempt each and every child of God. We should all, however, maintain our trust in the one who has overcome death and assures us of eternal life. There will be one final confrontation. You know how it comes out. Just as Jesus confronts Satan through us, the devil continues to confront the Lord through our temptation. He wins way too many battles. He wins too many souls back to his camp after they have departed from it. But at the appointed time, the final victory will belong to Jesus and Satan shall be cast into the lake of fire. But what a glorious day that will be for the faithful followers of Jesus to enter the glorious city where there is nothing that defiles and nothing that tells lies or makes a lie or somehow perpetuates a lie. Revelation 21, 27. That will all be gone. Confrontation shall be no more. And those who are faithful followers of Jesus shall be invited to eat of the tree of life. Won't that be a grand time when we can look back and say, concerning all of the conflicts, concerning all of the turmoil, concerning the temptations we've had to overcome, it was worth it. Concerning the endurance of everything that has been hard to endure, hard to uh, suffer in many cases, we can look back from heaven's perspective and say it was all worth it. The tree of life, ours forever. But in order to do that, you have to be a child of God. And if there's anyone here this evening who is not a child of God, yes, we've emphasized Satan, and we've emphasized how he confronts and all of the things that he's doing and all of the knowledge that we need to have to overcome that and the skills that we need for God to bless us with to make a sound arguments to others and try to persuade and convince them. We've seen all of that. But God is greater as proven by Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And if you've never participated in that death and burial and resurrection, as Paul describes it in Romans 6, 3 through 5, we invite you to do that this evening. If you are already a Christian, but you have been thinking about giving up, 
Don't let that thought stay in your mind. Dismiss it as fast as you can because the reward is so great. And we have such a great cloud of witnesses encouraging us that you don't want to think in those terms. If you need to reestablish yourself this evening as a faithful child of God, or if you need to obey the gospel by repenting of sins and being baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.